Um, good morning, First Unitarian, wherever you are today. I hope you are well, and I hope you are staying as connected as you possibly can with your community and with your loved ones. I want to briefly mention that Doug Fierro, one of our members, turned 80 yesterday. Congratulations and happy birthday, Doug. I want to uh, briefly uh, mention that uh, Don Taylor had a fall this week and broke a clavicle. He is home and recovering, and Nancy Taylor, uh, his wife, is scheduled for a hip replacement this coming week. I uh, hope that goes well, and we, we certainly wish you to uh, all the health and uh, speedy recovery that you can manage. So uh, I want to celebrate Mother's Day with a brief reflection on religion and symbolism, beginning with the goddess of Willendorf. And uh, you have seen somewhere the goddess of Willendorf. I'm sure you have. Goddess of Willendorf is uh, one of those smallish um, women figurines, um, usually has a large belly and large breasts. And these, uh, these figurines, um, and ones very much like it, go all the way back to the upper Paleolithic period, like 30,000 years ago. They represent some of the oldest pieces of art in existence. And there have been hundreds of these found, from Europe through the Middle East all the way to Siberia, and they suggest that uh, the goddess and fertility and womanhood in general were worshipped by widely divergent cultures for thousands of years. And, uh, and no one knows exactly how or exactly when, but you know things changed for the goddess. Uh, so that 2,500 years later, uh, in the book of Genesis, man is created by God, uh, and woman is created from the rib of a man, symbolically making women one step further removed from God. In fact, Judeo-Christian scripture is dominated by the male gender, and nearly the entire narrative and its many, many rules establish and maintain these constructs. And as we know, these constructs have incredible power, cultural power. They are woven into the language we speak. They inform the expectations we have of ourselves and of each other. They, uh, they're in the images we see, and therefore they are woven into the very thoughts that we think. Part of this construction that we've all been taught is that God, or the, the divine or the mystery at the heart of the universe or whatever language you might want to use is somehow out there uh, in whatever this physical world is. This is not God and whatever God is, it's not this physical world. That's the construction of Western civilization, pretty much at least spiritually. You put these two things together, that God is abstract and male and you have a recipe, not for spirituality, but for power, right? Not to put too fine a point on it, but if you put a male God out there, then culturally and theologically and politically, women end up down here. Modern thinkers extend this principle to the earth itself, and look what we're doing to our precious planet. Now, in my humble opinion, this, this is an example of religion at its worst, right? Cultural ideology as a global virus, to coin a metaphor, hurting instead of healing, dividing instead of uniting, crushing instead of liberating. But I like to think, I like to think we are in the midst, or at least the beginnings of a cultural revolution of sorts. And a lot of it has to do with how people experience God. And I don't mean just, not just necessarily think about God, but experience God. Many women I know, many in this congregation, left traditional Christianity for exactly this reason, which is that the abstract, out there, male God just didn't fit with the truth of their bodies, their lives, and their beings. 
You probably know that the fastest growing segment of the American cultural landscape are people who identify as spiritual but not religious. And what I hear when I talk with them and what I hear with, from many of you in our congregation, even within our own congregation, what I feel within my own being is a longing for a more embodied, here and now, imminent theology, spirituality. I'm going to quote Krista Tippett here, and, uh, and this will actually serve as our scripture reading for today. Krista Tippett wrote, our bodies tell us the truth of life that our minds can deny. Life is fluid, evanescent, evolving in every cell, in every breath, never perfect. To be alive is by definition messy, always leaning towards disorder and surprise. How we open or close to the, to the reality that we never arrive at safe, enduring stasis is the matter, the raw material of wisdom. And she continues, the core of life is about losses and death, both subtle and catastrophic, over and over again, and also about loving and rising again. So the cancer, the car accident, the global pandemic, that's my addition. These are extreme experiences of other trajectories we are already on. The aging, the loss of love, the death of dreams, the child leaving home, grief and sadness, sickness and death are not separate passages. They are entwined and grow from and through each other, planting us, if we will let them, more profoundly in our bodies, in all of their flaws and their grace. All of this raises some lovely, playful, liberating questions. What would it mean to live an embodied as an opposed to an otherworldly spirituality? Would it, would it change the way we make music together? Would it change the way we dance together? Would we come to think of ourselves as connected instead of isolated? Would we come to think of ourselves as lovers instead of workers and thinkers and doers? Would we throw out Robert's rules of order? Would it change how we raise our children? Would it change how we design our institutions? Like, can I sign up for that world right now? And I don't know the answers to all these questions. But here's what I do know. I know we will not solve current problems with the same kind of thinking that got us here. And I think, or I should say more precisely, I feel that Krista Tippett has it exactly right. Our bodies tell us the truth of life. The cellular experience of our bodies is the raw material of wisdom. And without that integration of our bodies, with our minds, of our hearts, with our heads, of our love, with our cleverness, without that wordless body understanding of interconnected unity, not just with other humans, but with the whole of living things and the systems that sustain all living things, without that we will never be whole. So loving whole is the title I've given my comments today. The idea came from a colleague of mine who was not a Unitarian Universalist who once asked me who in my life had helped to love me toward wholeness. Who in my life had helped to love me toward wholeness? And for me, those answers were pretty easy. Just so happened that the top five were all women. And the top of the list was my mother of blessed memory. And mom, I know you adored your little figurine of the goddess of Willendorf. And uh, wherever you might be, mom, this, this homily has been for you. And in the next few minutes, those of you who are present, 
As the music plays, you are invited to type into the chat box your own answer to this question. Who in your life has helped to love you toward wholeness? That person doesn't have to be your mother or your birth mother. They don't even have to identify as women. They only have to have had some role in helping to love you toward wholeness. I look forward to what you type in. I bless you this Mother's Day. I hope we get to see each other again very soon. Amen. Mm -hmm.